today for to, to the, the day going on. Um, and I guess to, to follow up on Carl's quip, um, it's true that when, it, when I graduated with my PhD, Eric Cornell simultaneously took a, a position at JILA at the University of Colorado, and he begged me to be his postdoc. I, I thought it would take them 10 or 15 years. It took them only two or three. So <laughs> there was a du dubious move, <laughs> dubious move for sure. Um, in any case, I've uh, since then, well, since about the mid-90s, have been working. Uh, I'm still an atomic physicist. That's my native hat, I guess. But uh, I've become a little more generally involved with computing and quantum computing in particular. And the cross there, of course, is that atomic systems, individual atoms, one at a time, a bunch of atomic clocks, if you will, uh, are the leading candidate to build a so-called quantum computer. And I want to in the colloquium, spend a few minutes defining some uh, very basic terms and motivation behind it, and then talk about some experiments, recent, uh, recent developments in the field. Um, and I, I presume most of you have heard the term quantum computing or quantum information. And right now, it still is a rather speculative field. And it's, it's scary uh, having a company also. And my co-founder, Jung Sang Kim, is in the audience here. He's a Stanford product at Duke University. Uh, uh, wave your hand, Jung Sang. <laughs> and so it's a, it's in a scary position having a, 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 a company that's building devices where we don't even really know what they're going to be useful for. It's a very interesting time, um, uh, but we are going to build it nevertheless, and it will. I, we we do feel that it will do something. So hopefully, I can tell you that story. So the the field has some hype. There's no doubt, and the, even the motivation. Uh, there's always. Um, there, there, there's always something hiding under every piece of good news you see in quantum computing. And the first piece of, I won't call it hype, but we know Moore's law very well, especially in this part of the country. This is the number of transistors on processors throughout the years um, from both Motorola and Intel. And this Moore's law uh, says something like the transistors are shrinking by a factor of two every Every, uh, every couple of years, or the number on a given chip is growing by a factor of two every few years. And the, a, a common thought here is that that can't continue forever. Um, and if you try to stay on this exponential over the next few decades, you find that you run into some interesting roadblocks. That is, the transistors are getting so small. Right now, they're you know, 7 to 10 nanometers in size, the features. If they get really, really small, they're going to uh, you know, come to the boundary of individual atomic structure. And at that point, we probably can't shrink the information storage in the usual way of making the transistors smaller. Um, now, I don't want to say that means that we have to go to quantum computing, but quantum computing does offer one potential to stay on a certain type of exponential, not exactly the number of transistors on a chip. And um, this was first pointed out remarkably uh, about 60 years ago uh, by Richard Feynman in his very famous APS speech, this is at an APS meeting, there's plenty of room at the bottom. Most, most of you probably know this one. Lots of cool quotes in that lecture, but the one I like best is that he's speculating after the advent of the first solid state transistor, which was a big thing. It wasn't 10 nanometers, it was more like 10, you know, 10 inches on a side or something. Uh, the, the, the idea of shrinking that thing down, and he imagined, the poss he imagined the possibility way back then of Moore's law, shrinking down to individual atomic scale. And he has this little zinger that when we get to that level of a few atoms per circuit, there are completely new opportunities for design. And uh, it's, it's just amazing. He had no idea what that opportunity would be. But he knew there would be an opportunity because the laws of physics are different when you have fundamental constituents of nature like atoms. These are the laws of quantum physics. And again, at the time, there was no, nobody, knew, nobody talked about quantum computing back in 1960. But let me uh, now, now step back and tell you a little bit about how, how you, the, the defining terms of a quantum computer from the bottom up, and we'll go from there in terms of its potential opportunities. And I think since the last 20, 25 years, I would say that this opportunity has shown itself to be the quantum computer. Okay, so quantum computers are very much like classical computers, only they operate not with bits, but so-called quantum bits. So instead of being in a state, definite state zero or one, like a flip-flop, uh, a quantum bit can be in a superposition of zero and one. And so uh, uh, as Shannon and Turing taught us, bits are abstract. You can if you can represent a bit in any physical system, it can be used as a computer. Well, qubits are the same. They, if, if you have a quantum system, 
um, whose superpositions follow a wave equation, uh, as is quantum mechanics, then you can have a quantum bit. Now, of course, this quantum system has to be very well isolated to maintain its coherence. And so a typical example might be two states in an atom. This is, a, this is a, an atom with one electron uh, that, uh, for, ignore this complex uh, nucleus with one electron, but uh, one electron is in two states at the same time. We're comfortable with that. It could be states of spin or orbital angular momentum, whatever. But we can encode a qubit uh, in those two states of a single atom. Um, and the problem, of course, is that if it, the system is not isolated or it's measured, the superposition collapses into a definite state, zero or one, with probabilities. So often, um, often when, I, when I lecture to a public audience about quantum computing or, or, or even quantum physics, um, it's very simple to state what quantum physics is. We have a wave equation over here and we have probabilistic measurement over here. Uh, that's pretty much all there is to it because all the math in quantum physics comes from how a alpha and beta, the, the coefficients of the superposition, how they evolve in time. That's a wave equation. And uh, if, if you're comfortable with wave equations in math, that has nothing, that's not necessarily a quantum concept, the wave equation, um, that's fine. The weird thing is, of course, that we have probabilities that have to be in the theory. So when you look at a quantum superposition, it randomly pops into one or the other state based on those weights. Now another concept with quantum bits that, um, that's a little more subtle is the concept of entanglement. And that is, if you have multiple quantum bits, they can be prepared in interesting superpositions when you consider the measurement process. Here's an interesting super, it doesn't look very interesting. It's just two quantum bits prepared either in the state zero, zero, or one, one. I should say and one, one with these weightings. And of course, when you measure this system, uh, it pops into one or the other. And what's interesting about this measurement is that whatever you do, those two qubits are correlated perfectly. And by the way, before you make the measurement, these two qubits could have been in principle separated a very large distance, in which case when you measure one, the other one's perfectly correlated. It seems like there's a wiring there. It seems like there's faster than light communication. Well, there's no communication of information, but there is something interesting about the entanglement. You get these strong correlations without real wires to be there. And sometimes I call this correlations without wires. Again, it, I'm being a little fast and loose here because those correlations are not necessarily useful. And to make use of them, uh, you have to do some other, well, you have, to do, you have to make bigger entangled states and do interesting things with them. So let me try to tell you that story. So uh, my last couple slides on general quantum computing. Well, clearly a quantum computer is going to involve lots and lots of quantum bits, lots of qubits, and we're going to throw all them together and make very complex entangled states. So um, if you have n quantum bits, there are two to the n possible states, two to the n n bit binary numbers. And you can, in general, in principle, store a superposition of all those exponential um, uh, binary numbers. So I like to think of um, how a quantum computer works. And again, this is very fast and loose. It's, it's sort of a good news, bad news, good news story. Uh, the first piece of good news is maybe evident. This, that's this sort of exponential growth you get just because the size of the space spanned by all these qubits grows exponential. There are exponentially many uh, amplitudes or weightings that you have to ascribe to n qubits. This is, just, this is just three qubits, so there's only eight of them. But if this were 300 qubits, this would be two to the 300 weightings that you would have to use to describe that quantum state. Two to the 300 is big. <laughs> it's, uh, it's 10 to the 90 or something like that. And that's more than the number of particles in the entire universe. So by some argument, if you need to do something that involves 10 to the 90 pieces of information, you have to use a quantum computer. You have to use a quantum system. There's not enough space in the universe using classical computing to just deal with that amount of information. OK, so that was itself a little bit of an overhyped statement because to use the information is really tricky. How do you get it out? And that's the bad news, of course. If you, uh, this is sort of a, it's, it's hard to draw a parallel. This is a parallel processor where we have multiple inputs at the same time. So here's a three-bit processor, and we have different weightings of those eight states. And then uh, after the quantum process happens, which is maybe mysterious, maybe it's computing the logarithm of all those inputs. The good news is you get to have this massively parallel processing. The bad news, of course, is that when you look at it, when you measure it, you only get one answer at the end. And we're still, you don't know what answer you get at the end because it's, it's probabilistic. 
So in fact, this is worse than a classical computer, I think, because um, uh, if you're computing a one-to-one -one function, you don't really know what output you got. So you might as well just do them in, in sequence, one after the other, but we can do that classically. Right? So quantum computing for one-to-one -one functions are probably no better than, they are no better than classical computers, which is too bad because I think most of the computing we do is one-to-one. -one. <laughs> most of the uh, uh, computing, not all of it. And that's the final piece of good news. And so uh, this, so I'm sure Feynman had reached this conclusion in 1959 and didn't really know where the opportunity was. But in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, this fellow, David Deutsch, started toying with storing information in quantum systems. And he came up with some interesting ideas that involved um, interference of these, uh, of these weightings or these amplitudes before measurement. Remember, these, these um, amplitudes follow a wave equation, and like any wave property, like, sorry, like any, like any wave that can be described by a wave equation, there's the process of interference. And the idea in a good quantum algorithm is generally for all these interferences, I've, it's hard to draw this, but these red dots are sort of interferences between pathways, if you want. Um, all the, almost all the interferences are destructive, whereas only one or a few, a very small number, are constructive. And then when you make a measurement, there's very low entropy here. There, when you make a measurement, you can get information on all the inputs. Okay? So th there exists, the good news is there exist applications where this works. And the tricky thing is, what are these red dots? These are quantum gates. These are similar to the NAND and OR and, and XOR gates we have in classical computing, but they involve quantum bits and quantum interactions. I've drawn them as binary interactions between any pair of, any pair of bits. Um, Okay, so I'm not an algorithms expert, but there are a few very popular algorithms you probably know about. One of them is factoring large numbers. If you take a number with a thousand digits, and if I give you that number and ask you to factor it, um, there is no known fast algorithm for that. It's exponential in the size of the input. In fact, you can't factor a thousand digit number, it's too big. Well, Peter Shore in 1994 showed that a quantum computer, if sufficiently large to store the big number and do have workspace, it could factor that number fast. And he basically realized a very old result in number theory that uh, if you find the periodicity of a certain complex function involving the number you want to factor, if you find the period of that, you can show how it's related to the factors of that large number. And find the period. The period of a function is exactly of this type. The period of a function is a, it depends on all the inputs. So it's a global property. And that's what we look for in good quantum algorithms, global properties. And that's one example. It's a killer example because the inability to factor large numbers is behind all popular public key encryption, as you probably know. So um, the fact that quantum computers could, if they could be built, would factor numbers uh, was very important to certain three-letter agencies. And in fact, these certain three-letter agencies were in a position 20 years ago of funding fundamental quantum science research to see when and if one of these things could be built. So we had our own Moore's Law in the field, and here's, here's one, one expression of that in publications. This is over the last uh, 15 years or so, the number of, uh, from Google Scholar, the number of articles per year with, one, one of the, with any one of these three terms in it. So it's a huge field now. Lots of it's, most of it's theoretical, uh, which stands to reason because there are not a whole lot of known killer apps like factoring. But they are out there, and, and in fact, um, before I start talking about experiments and, and physical platforms, um, one very general application out there, and again, um, it's, I, I can't really point to exactly how this is going to work, but the idea of optimizing is just like one of those global out outputs, right? If, if I ask you what the tallest peak in the Rocky Mountain Range is, that's a function of, of the entire landscape, but there's only one answer. So if I give you a function that's very spiky, this is only two variables, it's very easy to identify the minimum. But if I give you a function with lots and lots of inputs, it's very hard, there's exponentially many configurations, you can't test them all. But the ground state is in fact a unique, uh, uh, a, a unique property of all the inputs. And it may be true that in certain cases, a quantum computer might allow us to find those minima. And um, th this, this can apply to all kinds of different examples. And, and again, I won't get into details of this. Again, this will look over hyped, but I have to tell you, optimizers right now are approximates. They're heuristics. The best classical optimizers, we can't prove why they work and why they produce the best answer. And I think probably the first 
application of a quantum computer will be some heuristic that you can't prove that, it's, that it'll beat anything classical, but it does beat everything we know classically. And my favorite example is that actually the traveling salesman problem, which we know to be an NP complete, NP hard problem. That is, what's the, uh, identify the shortest path between a bunch of cities. That scales exponentially with the number of cities. Um, now, you can apply classical algorithms on this and get the best answer you think you have. And if a quantum system can somehow find a better answer, even though it's not the best, if it's better than a classical optimizer, then it's useful. Um, and so it remains to be seen whether a quantum system can, can model uh, the traveling salesman problem. But you know, the traveling salesman problem to me is just an energy landscape. And you're trying to minimize some energy function that, that depends on lots of variables. That's what we do in quantum. We have Hamiltonians, which are energy functions. And if we can carve out and control that Hamiltonian uh, uh, with, uh, with sufficient accuracy to our underlying problem, maybe uh, there, there's some headway to be made there. Um, and there's other work, of course, more in the physics side of things. Magnetism is very interesting. Even classically, it's interesting. But quantum magnetism, having uh, bar magnets effectively that can be both north and south at the same time, that's like a qubit. And if you get a bunch of qubits on a lattice, how they interact and form exotic states of quantum magnetism is very interesting. It's also uh, related to an optimization problem that looks like a nonlinear spiky function with lots of variables. And another uh, example of optimizers involves simulating complex structures where, I mean, this is probably way too complex for the next many years, but even a simple molecule with maybe 100 electrons, uh, there's, there's, too much, there's, there's too much configuration space. What is the ground, what's the binding energy of that molecule? It's very hard to calculate. We can approximate it using many uh, 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 numerical techniques in chemistry. Um, but it may be that if we can model this as a Hamiltonian, a coupled fermion Hamiltonian, uh, map it onto qubits, and it may be that this, this will be an interesting application. So again, I'm a little bit on thin ice. I'm starting to learn about these things, but I'm more of a hardware guy uh, coming from atomic physics. And I'm glad to say that right now, um, there are a couple of platforms out there, physical platforms that are looking really interesting to build. And so this is a figure I stole from uh, an article in Science uh, a, a year or two ago. And so there are a couple of platforms, and I would say superconductors and trapped ions um, are by far and away the leading candidates to build small quantum computing devices. And there are some other very interesting ideas, and this will, you know, the research in these and other platforms will continue, I think, to, um, uh, to evolve. And I think one that's missing here, maybe, yeah, I'll comment on that later, neutral atoms that are popped into Rydberg states uh, has, over just the last year, uh, it's looking very interesting. Um, but trapped ions and superconducting loops, the reason, I guess the reason they're, they're very interesting now is if you look at, remember the gates that I showed, the interactions between qubits. With these systems, we can control those interactions with the sufficient accuracy over the last several, uh, you know, decade and a half or so, the fidelity or the, the error rate per quantum gate is getting better and better. And by quantum gate, I mean uh, a gate sort of like an AND gate between two qubits. It's a two qubit gate, so it's nonlinear, and that allows you to make entangled states. Um, and in both these platforms, things have gotten better and better. Um, the one thing I want you to keep in mind, and I'll return to this later, is that all of these data points, every one of them, involved exactly two qubits. So that's why this, this plot is sort of irrelevant, entirely irrelevant. I mean, it's good to know the fundamental limits of a gate between two qubits. But if you have lots of other qubits around, that will almost certainly um, not help the gate you're trying to do between those two qubits. Crosstalk and other aspects will, will come into play, okay? But this is, again, sort of a, I come from a background in metrology and atomic clocks. We like to know what the fundamentals are, and both these systems are very good. So atoms, why atoms? Well. Atoms, in a sense, are nature's qubit because they're standards. In fact, we use energy levels within an atom that are defined by the hyperfine levels and the ground state of these atoms. These are the same levels that are used for atomic clocks. And they're, uh, they're incredibly coherent, very long lifetimes. And uh, even more importantly, uh, the atoms, they're standards, so they're reproducible. That's, that's what makes a good clock. You can reproduce it. An atom of ytterbium here is the same as an atom of ytterbium in Washington, exactly the same. Well, to a part in 10 to the 12, easy. If you want a part in 10 to the 15, we can do that too, but it's, it's much better than we need. No solid state platform can have nearly the, the rep, replication of individual atoms. Okay. Well, 
Um, the great thing about solid state platforms, you can print zillions of them on a chip. And that, in a sense, is one aspect of scalability. You can throw lots of them and scale it. But because every qubit's different in these other systems, and those differences can even drift over time, that's a big problem when you try to scale things up. Now, in atomic physics, we don't have that problem in scaling up. The problem we have in scaling up is controlling the system. And that means that we have to resort to techniques in cold atom physics, laser cooling. These atoms are in a vacuum chamber. And, they, and they're probably, they're trapped in, in three dimensions. In, in the case of the platform I'll talk about, atomic ions, they're held in an ion trap. This is uh, a, a chip trap that is made out of silicon at Sandia. And uh, I'll show another picture later. Uh, individual ions form a linear crystal and it floats above this surface. This chip has, I think, uh, uh, I think 48 electrodes. You can see these little piano keys. Um, kind of too detailed there. But the idea is we can trap individual ions and they stay there for a good long time and they're all identical. And our wires are provided by lasers. And let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so uh, now diving down into an individual, a particular atomic clock qubit, and in this case, I'm going to use ytterbium 171 plus, but there are a handful of other ions that are equally, well, they're, they're, they're also appropriate. It comes down in atomic physics, you choose an atom and that chooses your host of lasers and so forth. And so ytterbium is particularly nice in terms of the lasers that we need. As I said, the qubit is stored in the hyperfine ground state. These are, so, these are sometimes called clock states in, in atoms because they're so stable. And I've written this frequency. It's a microwave, 12.6 12 gigahertz. I've written it all the way down to one hertz. I could write a few more digits if you want, but that's kind of boring. We don't need that resolution. But every qubit has this frequency. Now, there are a couple of other levels here. These are Zeeman levels. They're shifted with a magnetic field, but these two... They're clock states, meaning that they're, they're, they're not perturbed by external magnetic fields very much. That's what makes them good. Now, the detection of, uh, when we want to detect a qubit, so we can store a superposition using microwaves or lasers, I'll show you in a minute. When we want to detect this qubit, um, in atomic physics, we almost always uh, use cycling transitions, optical transitions to excited states. And in this case, when we shine light in the near UV, um, we know this wavelength to about nine digits. Um, it couples to excited state, and this excited state can only come back down here. Now, in fact, it can come to these two, but we can clean those out easily, just a, a detail. But this is a cycling transition. It goes up and down really fast. The single atom will emit 10 to the 8 photons per second, so it's a very bright source. Um, and in fact, here's, here's, here's real data on integrating a uh, single atom prepared, and I call it spin up. Sometimes we call that one and zero, bright, dark, spin up, spin down. In the spin-up state, uh, in 50 microseconds, we collect roughly 30 clicks. So we get a click every microsecond. Well, I said it was 10 to the 8 photons per second, but we're only collecting 10 to the 6 per second. So that means we're only collecting 1% of the light, but it's still a pretty healthy signal, even after integrating for a few tens of microseconds. So this is a repeated experiment over many times. You see the Poissonian statistics. Now, the whole point here, is that, that's an image, by the way, of that single atom uh, under the same conditions. The whole point here is that if the atom's in the other state, same experiment, the only difference the atoms in the other state, well, now we're 12 gigahertz away from a line that is only 20 megahertz wide. So the atom is transparent to that light. And this is the data, we see nothing. We see darkness mostly. And the point here is that these two are so well discriminated that even in a single shot, we can detect with very high efficiency. And I would say, Jung Sang's in the audience here, but I didn't plant this. He's, this, is, this is the kind of uh, world beating data here on hyperfine qubits. You can easily get three nines of detection fidelity um, if you have good detectors and good collection optics. So we have really good detecting. By the way, in, in a quantum bit, when you want to measure it, you need to measure it with very high fidelity because you might need to measure a million of them. So that means you better have lots of nines in your fidelity per qubit. Okay? Okay, so how do we make the qubit to begin with in a coherent state? Well, we, we actually do this with another set of lasers that, uh, that drives two photon transitions. And the reason this is important is that um, this is a coherent process because each of these two lines uh, from the laser is very far detuned from any excited state. So it's dispersive, the interaction. It's coherent. And we can drive so-called pi pulses, like from NMR language, and make superpositions. And we can eventually do gates here. And I would say the single most important feature of Ytterbium 171 is that there is sort of a magic wavelength where this is best. 
and it turns out to be 355 nanometers, which is an important wavelength because it's, it's a third harmonic of YAG. It's easy to get that kind of a laser, as much power as you want. Um, this, this is a pulse laser, which is technically, this is a little bit technical, but that's good too because we have a frequency comb so we can drive these transitions and control the rep rate. We can control uh, what we're doing in the atom. So I said you can buy as much power as you want. This is a similar, this is 351 nanometers, but the same type of a laser that's used in, uh, in inertially confined fusion up at Livermore. Well, the one we use is quite a bit smaller, um, but the important thing about this laser, again, as soon, if you're saying, oh, you're building a computer, but you have a laser, well, this is actually a good laser. It only has one button, the on button. This is made for lithography. It's made for the upper levels of, of CMOS lithography, um, and the coherent makes 200 of these a year, and they're turnkey, literally. So when we turn these on, they work for years. That's, the, I mean, I'm, I'm very comfortable inside any laser. That's what I've done most of my career. Uh, on, but I'm just as comfortable not doing that. So the laser is sort of now a black box that we can use to control our qubit. It's important because this is going to drive all of our gates. It's going to drive all of our operations. It is the bottleneck of everything we're doing with these atom, uh, these trapped ion uh, uh, quantum algorithms. So how do we entangle them? This is, this is sort of an old story. I mean, it's the, the, the fundamental way that you entangle uh, atomic ions was put forth uh, literally weeks after Serac and Zoller, Ignacio was actually in the building earlier today, but I don't think he's here now. Um, Ignacio, Serac, and Peter Zoller, literally weeks after they heard of the, alg the algorithm for factoring numbers, they came up with this idea of how to do gates and how to build an ion trap quantum computer. It was not at the system level, it was just how to do the fundamentals, how to do entanglement between any pair of ions in, uh, in principle. And it was refined uh, later by uh, several others, uh, especially Molmer and Sorensen, and that's kind of the version everybody uses now. And this is a, a, a basic idea of how it works. It's not hard. It involves laser forces. If you know what optical tweezers are, we're going to do this with individual atoms. The idea is we can use those 355 lasers, if these are your turbium ions, to apply a force on any one of these atoms. And the force is interesting because it, it depends on the qubit state. It depends on whether you're spin up or down. And that can be done through selection rules and polarization and so forth. I won't get into the details, but suffice to say that uh, if I shine a laser from below, it can, uh, it, you need a pair of lasers actually from below and, and, and above. Um, um, you can transfer momentum to the atom in such a way that if the atom is spin up, it moves up. If it's spin down, it moves down. So. If you want to do something between these two atoms, you simultaneously illuminate those two atoms and only those two atoms. Now, if you do that, you'll note that there are four possibilities of these two qubits. If they're down, down, they both move down together. And note their Coulomb interaction. These are charges, remember? I didn't talk at all about the trap. This is, this is a linear crystal of charges. If they're both down, they move down together, and their, their Coulomb interaction is exactly the same as it was. No change. If they're both up, it's the same. But if they're down up, if they're in mixed states, down up or up down, then they're a little further apart. And that, that little extra distance due to the, the diagonal connecting them amounts to this amount of energy. They're further apart, they're in a lower energy state. And you can see it falls off like one of our R cubed. It's a dipole-dipole interaction because you're making, if you have up plus down here, a superposition, you've made a little, a little electric dipole you've separated the charge. And so this stands to reason you expect a one over our cube potential here. These dipoles are pretty big. They're in, if you're familiar with Dubai units, these are big, these have big dipole moments because we can, we can move these guys several nanometers, the atoms. And of course they're much smaller than a nanometer each. So these atoms are, uh, they're separated a good distance. Now Mark can separate atoms by 50 centimeters, so we're not gonna compete with them. But those are neutral atoms. They don't, they, they don't follow this interaction either. But it's the same idea. You, uh, Mark also applies a spin-dependent force in his uh, atom interferometers, and you can let them fall 10 meters, and they're, they're really far apart. Here, the atoms are fixed, but we, it's sort of the same physics. Now, if you look at these four uh, possibilities, only the uh, states with different spins find a phase lag in their quantum state. That's just the wave equation. If you change the energy of these guys, then they, they have a phase lag. And this gate's very interesting because it's nonlinear. What happens to up-up is not a product of down-up and up-down. Okay, so when, when this angle, when this phase angle is pi over two, that's equivalent to making full entangled state between those two ions. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to hide, I, 
I, I, I didn't want to hide, but I kind of had to, is that this only works if this operation is really fast. So you zip them, uh, uh, zap them, and then they, then they return. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's like a rubber band or violin string. There's all kinds of modes of motion. That's indeed a problem. Um, but we deal with that by, I'm not going to get into too many details, but we can shape the laser pulse to take care of all those normal modes of motion. And keep that in mind, because we're not going to be doing this with hundreds of ions, but maybe dozens of ions. Okay? So keep that in mind. But the same, it's, it's a very similar physics. It's still the Coulomb interaction that's mediating uh, this entanglement. So we're mapping spin to motion, and then motion to spin. That was the original Sir Atkins Zoller idea. Now, in fact, the, the native, this is actually called an icing gate, if you want. Uh, there's a ZZ type interaction, effectively. In fact, uh, in the lab, it's a little more complicated. We actually have an XX icing model. It's a different kind of gate. And this is the evolution operator of that gate uh, using NMR language. And these gates aren't fast. They're t in microseconds or so. For a computer, you want fast, of course. But this is a quantum computer. We don't, we don't need fast. We have, we have an exponential entanglement in, in our back pocket. Um, in any case, because atoms have inertia and we have to push them around, the gates are relatively slow compared to superconductors. The fidelities so far, again, with just two and exactly two, you can get three nines so far, but that can probably be even better. Um, with lots of ions, we're 98, 99% right now. And again, it's all about the lasers and controlling those lasers. Um, you know, I should comment briefly that um, in superconducting circuits, I didn't talk much about them, their gates are about a thousand times faster. So that's good. Clock speed is a lot faster. Their decoherence is about a million times faster. So um, anyway, it's the ratio that sort of matters here. And uh, the superconducting uh, decoherence is a big issue. Just the fundamental qubit itself losing coherence. So as long as you have some time to wait, depending on the depth of your circuit, how long your quantum computation is, the ion system will be able to go for a long, long time. All right, so using this basic idea, um, we started from the ground up with just a few ions. And we actually learned something very interesting in doing this. It might sound trivial, but this is a schematic of an experiment with just five, just five qubits here. and. Um, uh, the, the, these three five five nanometer laser beams, the one uh, coming from from the back side is global. It's big and fat. Very easy to deal with that one. The hard one is this one, where we have individual beams that can be turned on and off with a very fancy optical switch. Here, we can turn on all five at the same time. We can turn on any single, any pair, any triplet, whatever. And it's all from electronic controls on this multi-channel acoustic optic modulator. And of course. This Coulomb interaction is long range. We can apply a gate between any pair. And we do it, you know, um, I should say this, this was a one over R cubed uh, type of distance dependence. But we, in fact, are better than that because we do gates that couple to all the normal modes of motion. And the normal modes of motion are long range. They're not one over R cubed. So we actually can do gates that are independent of distance with a system of five and probably a few dozen, we think we can scale that. So we can do any of these, uh, with five qubits or ten pairs, we can do any of those ten gates. We actually have to pre-calculate the laser pulse schedule to do that. There's some classical physics involved, it's not hard. And then we program those pulses and we're off to the races. And what we realized in this system is that it was stable enough that we could just run it for hours and hours without thinking about the atomic physics and the vacuum system and the laser. We were at the PC running circuits even though it was just five qubits. And so we had to develop a system that um, I call it a full stack, but this is, a, I should say, a full university stack as best we can do. At the bottom is the hardware where we're turning all the knobs, but then there's the pulse shaping, making these lasers. We pre-calculate them, but somehow they have to be called from above. Which ions do we want to do a gate on? These are XX gates and rotation gates from NMR. But if you look in the textbooks, there's something called the C-naught gate, the Hadamard gate, which is sort of a square root of naught gate. Um, and we have, to we, have to, we have to convert the textbook gates into what we have in the lab. And that's sort of a level of compiling. We're starting to look like computer scientists here. And now at the very top, we have algorithms. Somebody says, oh, run the, run the Shor factoring algorithm on five qubits. I mean, I don't know why we'd ever do that. That's a pretty small number. But there, 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 there's a circuit for that. And we have to go through this entire stack 
of processes, and almost none of them are really physics. <laughs> so this is an interesting exercise in, I don't want to, I won't call it systems engineering, but this full stack idea um, is something that will have to play a role in the future as we build bigger systems. So I want to go through a few, again, these are toy algorithms on these five qubits. The first one, in fact, this was uh, uh, among the first ever demonstrated. It's called the bernstein vazirani algorithm. And uh, <clears throat> this is one of the so-called oracle algorithms that is sort of a toy. It means it's kind of useless. It's like the game 20 questions, right? If I think of a concept and you can, I can, you, you can ask me 20 yes or no questions, what is that concept? So you have to somehow, that, the oracle is my, the concept I'm holding in my head. And here, the oracle is a function uh, that has n bits on the input, and it produces one bit on the output. So this is a dot product of, of two n bit numbers, uh, and it's just a dot product, so it's only one bit. And the question is, what is C? What's the hidden string in that function? Well, classically, you have to evaluate it at least n times to find out what C is, right? You would evaluate it for in input of 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 to get every uh, digit of C. Cla uh, classically, it requires n queries of that function. And that's the oracle, the function evaluation. Quantum mechanically, you can do it just once. So if somehow it's very expensive to evaluate F, then you get a, uh, a win by doing this in a quantum way. And the reason this works, of course, is that we're going to be able to evaluate a superposition of the inputs and process it in just the right way, where C is the output of the circuit. And I won't go into details. This is just a four qubit circuit. We use, we use the fifth qubit as an ancilla working space. And these are called Hadamard gates. These are called controlled not gates. So depending on the state of that, uh, that rail, you flip this one. By the way, this is a space-time diagram. All quantum circuits are space-time, space vertical, and time goes from left to right. So you apply these gates so they're in superposition, then you do, um, uh, the circuit itself has the vector C encoded in there. So you can see uh, wherever a, a bit of C is one, you have a controlled not gate between that and the ancilla. And then you do further rotations, then you measure these four. And you basically measure C. You have to read C right out in this operation. And you've only computed F once because C is encoded in that oracle. You've only used the circuit once. So here's the results on our five qubit ion trap quantum computer. 16 possible oracles for four bits, and this was the detected state. You can see it's about 90%, 85, 90%. Well, each gate is about 98% good, and each of these controlled not gates has a bunch of XXs. So there's a lot of gates here, so it stands to reason it's not gonna be perfect. Um, the important thing uh, I should mention is that we can do a gate, again, between any pair, um, even though that's not really exercised in this algorithm. So as it happens, um, IBM, around the same time we started this experiment, IBM unveiled their quantum experience, superconducting quantum computer. And to their credit, they put it on the cloud. And uh, you know, it was looked at uh, by some of the community as being a stunt. Um, I, I, I thought it was great because the amount of engineering to, to, uh, to get a system and stand back and let people dial in their instructions and actually run, very hard to do that. I don't want to say it's going to, you know, five qubits, you're not going to do anything interesting. We all know that. But uh, uh, Jerry Chow and Jay Gambetta are sort of the leads on the technical team at IBM, and they have this system all hardwired. So we ran this algorithm on their system. And in fact, they had very similar fidelities to ours, 98, 99%, five qubits. And we got similar results. Not unexpected. Now, what is different in their system is that their qubits are connected in a different way. Uh, it's a 2D, uh, it's, it's a, a 2D square lattice, but they only have five, so this is the unit cell, I guess. Um, it's not very well connected. They can't do a gate between these two, for instance. But for this algorithm, you don't have to, as long as you're smart about qubit assignment. Now, um, you clearly pick this fifth qubit to be the middle one, because it's the one that has to interact with all the others. Okay? And that's why it works pretty well. Well, it doesn't work for all algorithms, though. This is the hidden shift algorithm that was first pointed out to us by Martin Rodler at Microsoft. He called us up and literally called us up and he said, you know, I've been running the IBM system and we've been testing this hidden shift algorithm and it doesn't work very well on the IBM system. I heard you have a five qubit system, can we run it on yours? And he said, sure, send the circuit. <laughs> so they, they sent the circuit and um, the hidden shift algorithm, by the way, it's another oracle. If I give you two functions, F and G, they're identical except for an unknown shift in the input, it takes exponentially many queries to find that shift. You have to evaluate at least half of the input to find out what that shift is. 
quantum mechanically just one. So this is actually even better than the bernstein vazirani It's exponential gain in the number of queries. Here's the circuit for a particular function, I won't even say what it is, in a particular shift. And it's, you can see this is a more complicated circuit. It's more connected. Uh, and when we run it on the two systems, we see a, a definite degradation in the IBM system. It's not about the qubits in the superconducting system, it's about their connectivity. And uh, maybe this is obvious to you, but uh, it's, it's interesting that if you're going to run an algorithm, you better have a system that's, that's appropriately connected to run that algorithm. And so there's, there's lots of black art in how to do that. It's more computer science, again. How do you assign qubits in the right way? Um, how do you make the connections and so forth? So uh, we didn't have a cloud. We had grad students taking orders basically on the phone. And this, this, is, this became a little bit of a, um, it's been a little bit of an issue in the lab. We've had lots of orders. <laughs> Over the last few years, we've been running lots of algorithms. Again, these are only, these are only a few qubits. Um, but you can see uh, th there's one simulation in particular. This was um, communicated to us by Ann Matsura's team up at Intel. Um, Intel desperately wants to get, uh, get some kind of hardware working. So th their, their, their theory team called us and wanted to work on some very small Fermi Hubbard simulation, just a two site model. But in fact, this is the deepest circuit we've ever uh, uh, demonstrated. Only five qubits, but it had 160 gates. Most of them were entangling gates. Um, and actually, uh, I, wanna, I wanna comment on one, one particular uh, uh, experiment that has sort of Stanford uh, fingerprints all over it. Scrambling test. I talked a little bit about this this morning with, with Lenny Susskind's group. Um, so the, the concept of quantum scrambling is more than entanglement. Quantum scrambling means that a system of qubits somehow uh, samples the entire space spanned by the qubits. The entanglement is sort of complete. I guess technically, if you look at any, we were just, just uh, talk, talking about the definition of scrambling. If you look at any subsystem then, uh, that, that's smaller than the, the overall system, um, then, then its entropy is greater than zero. So there's sort of massive entanglement. And what's interesting is quantum scrambling is thought to model what happens in a black hole. Because a black hole is, is, is uh, it's, it's isolated and therefore it should be described by a, some monstrous unitary operator. And the question is, how do we differentiate a scrambling unitary operation from a non-scrambling one that might be entangling but not fully scrambling? And this, uh, this is relevant to the, the, uh, the, the, the black hole information paradox. Uh, Patrick Hayden and John Preskill spoke about this a while ago dealing with, um, is information actually lost in a black hole? What if you have one half of an entangled pair and you throw the other pair into that black hole? Is that information lost? Well, the pair that you threw into the black hole gets scrambled, and if you can observe the Hawking radiation from the black hole as it evaporates, you can make correlations with the one you kept behind. And in fact, it seems like you can, you know, this is the black hole information paradox. Um, and I think Lenny and his group talked about how this connects to you know, wormholes, being able to travel, uh, travel through space-time. And again, I'm on thin ice talking about those, but I do know about quantum circuits. And here's a quantum circuit. What does this have to do with scrambling? Well, this is a seven qubit quantum circuit. And what I'll note is that there's a three qubit unitary. Remember, this is time and space. Um, and there's U, the unitary, and there's its inverse, U dagger. To me, that's just a circuit. But the property of that unitary, that whether it's scrambling or not, is, is uh, rather tricky. And the connection to black hole is that those are the black holes. <laughs> um, this is a very minimal black hole of just three qubits. And this one is, I guess, spinning backwards because it's the reversed black hole. So, but you know, this is a three qubit quantum circuit. We can apply U dagger. It's just, uh, it's not hard to do that. Now, what this circuit does, it's really cool how this works. And there's a nice interpretation in terms of wormholes and so forth. Uh, the idea is that all of these qubits are initialized except an initial one which is prepared in some random state, a known initial state. We, we of course, prepare many different states. And we entangle pairwise uh, these two, these two, these two. We run U and U dagger. In a sense, we're running forward and backward in time. And then we make Bell measurements. What that means is that we, do a, we see whether these two are in a particular entangled state. And based on a positive measure of any one of these pairs in a particular entangled state, this, uh, Q, th this unitary is scrambling if and only if that state gets teleported here. And so we can directly measure this state here and say, well, was it a replica of the initial state? And we repeat the experiment many times and do tomography on that state and show whether it is or not. And by the way, we can 
we can apply any unitary, and I won't get into the details here. This is a three qubit unitary. It has lots of gates you recognize, x, x, and r's. There's a parameter in these rotation gates. When theta is zero, there is no scrambling. When theta is pi over two, it's complete scrambling. So we actually have a variable scramble unitary here. And here's the data. When theta is zero, um, the teleportation fidelity is a half, meaning no, no scrambling. And when it's one, it's not perfect, but because the teleportation is bigger than a half, then we can say unambiguously there's scrambling. And importantly, we can separate the effects of decoherence in this unitary from masking a scrambling signal. And again, uh, the, the, this was, uh, we worked in collaboration with Benny Yoshida at Perimeter and Norm Yao at Berkeley on this experiment. And Brian Swingle, by the way, you know, again, Stanford stamps all over this. He's now at Maryland and we talk to him all the time about scaling this to bigger systems and taking further measurements. Um, so, I talked about quantum computing, but let's step back a little bit. We can also trap lots and lots of ions, even if we don't poke individual laser beams on each ion. Um, and we've, in one of our experiments, we have uh, you know, between 10 and 50 uh, uh, atoms along a line. And instead of doing discrete gates, XX gates, we can apply this overall Hamiltonian to the system. Um, this is an icing interaction between all pairs. And JIJ is the icing coupling matrix. It's long range, and in practice, it falls off with a power law. It's not nearest neighbor. It's not the one you learned in, in STAT MEC 101. This is long range, so it's very, uh, even though the ions are in 1D, the interaction is not 1D necessarily. And we can apply a, a competing transverse field to this icing model. And I won't get into too many details here, but we can do all kinds of experiments in the dynamics of spins undergoing this type of interaction. Because these two parts of the Hamiltonian don't commute, there's lots of entanglement and uh, very rich structure in, in the states we measure. So um, with 50 or so ions, here's a string of them all prepared along one direction, the, the, the spin up state along Z when we measure them. Um, as we increase B over J and we quench this Hamiltonian, we turn it on suddenly, after a certain amount of time, we measure. We wait, wait for some amount of time, roughly 10, 1 over J times. Uh, anyway, that's a little technical. But as we increase B over J, there's, it's a little hard to see here, but the, uh, and we take lots and lots of data, the size of the domain that's formed along the X direction uh, reaches a minimum, and then it comes back up. And if we plot the mean domain size as a function of B over J, we see this kink. So that's called a dynamical phase transition. It's not an equilibrium phase transition. It's a weird system. But uh, I guess the only point I want to make is that you can't calculate where that's going to be. The system's too complicated. There are too many spins. There's two to the 53 configurations of these spins. And even though most of them you can rule out, it's still a really hard calculation because this is a long range interaction. I don't want to say this is a quantum computer. I don't even want to say it's useful. But it does show you something. You could argue that this is something that says that uh, dealing with qubits is something that you maybe can't do using classical simulations. Uh, what's even more fun, I promised I would talk about Rydberg atoms. Uh, at, 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 at the same time, Misha Lukin's group uh, had a similar experiment with 51 atoms prepared in Rydberg states with very short range interactions and they see interesting order emerge there as well. These are neutral atoms, they don't have very long lifetimes, but the interactions are very strong. Kind of a complementary hardware. If you're wondering why we stopped at 50, well, the vacuum wasn't good enough. <laughs> uh, with, with, if we trap bigger crystals, then they, the background gas collides with them and they melt. So one of our projects, and a lot of the communities going this direction, is going cold. I hate to do that, especially on a system you want to call a computer, but uh, everything we've done so far, the system is at room temperature, even though the atoms are laser cooled. This is, uh, this is not a dilution refrigerator, but uh, we get the electrodes that hold the ions in contact with a four Kelvin reservoir. And we can hold big ion chains pretty much forever. There's a little kink in the imager here. I apologize for that. But there is a, there's a missing tooth here. This is a different isotope of ytterbium. And the important thing is that that gap stayed there all day, um, uh, meaning that there was not a single melting collision. So we're going to continue to do simulation experiments on much bigger systems here. So let me start to step back. And I, the next plot I, sort of, I stole from Google but I acknowledge them. This is from Harp and Nevin. And this is an interesting plot. Sometimes it's called the, um, the NQ plot, uh, where the number of qubits, if you want to build a big system, what's interesting? Where should we go for? What should we shoot for? What, what trajectories of our technology should we go after? Well, the number of qubits, we clearly want lots of qubits, but we also need lots of gates. 
if you have a million qubits, you better be able to do, well, if you can only do two gates, it doesn't matter how many qubits you have. Um, so if you want to go up here, you're not going to get uh, anything that you can't simulate classically. Likewise, if you only have two qubits, uh, you don't need eight nines of fidelity if you only have two qubits. So you clearly want to move up here. And I didn't talk at all about error correction. That's a colloquium in its own right. But, uh, but when you get large numbers of gates on large numbers of qubits, you can do error correction to stabilize the entire computation, which is a fascinating subject. But unfortunately, we're really far from there. So what I've plotted here uh, with a little bit of license, um, the black dots and this gray dot, are, this is existing uh, data in trapped ion technology. And we have ideas on how, to, how we're going to move up here. And I'll just share very briefly with those plans. Now, it's very hard to measure what's going on in superconductors. This gray line, by the way, is courtesy of D-Wave. Um, because we, we're not sure really how to say what they're doing is even quantum. So I gave them, uh, I gave them 10 to the minus 1 gates. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, super, the, the superconducting systems that we see out there, it's not clear how many, what the gate depth is. And as they grow the number of qubits, it appears that their gate depth gets smaller. But again, not, not a lot of this, this data is somewhat projected and so forth. Um, so some of the latest data, I don't want to say it's not interesting, but uh, it's not clear that those are on the correct path of scaling. You really have to go up into the right. This dot is this, this point is grayed out because it, we don't have full control. This is the data I showed you with 53 qubits. Um, but we can extrapolate that into how many effective gates there are, but we don't have individual full control of them, so it's not really along the path we want. There's five and seven if you're asking. Yeah, all right, tiny bit, tiny bit of mo movement. But we're, we're going to make it bigger. And I want to, I'm going to, since I'm running out of time, I just want to skip. And and have you know that, um, you know, a, t a typical AMO, let me see, sorry. A typical AMO experiment looks like this, of course. And this is probably why it's very hard to make it bigger. Um, this, this is, uh, in fact, an experiment where we, where we, um, where we entangled two, uh, two separate ions in two separate vacuum chambers based on photons. I didn't talk about that, but this is uh, how we hope to scale up in the long run by having a modular architecture where we have maybe 50 here, 50 here, 50 here, and use photons to scale, to, to, to bridge the gaps. Um, that's in a very expensive process, it's slow, um, but it still, at least it allows you to make the system bigger without having a huge crystal in any one spot. But of course, the problem in all atomic physics is this. In fact, the atoms are only, you know, they're right here. And we have, you know, all this is, uh, many of you will recognize the lasers that we have there and so forth. And, um, you know, to me, it reminds me of the old ENIAC picture with the vacuum tubes. <laughs> and and th this, is, this is definitely not good. Um, so on the other hand, um, you know, Mark, Mark Kaspers in the front row here. I think his, his company, AO Sense, was the first to really attempt to engineer atomic systems for instruments, for instrumentation. And so uh, with Jung San Kim uh, in the audience, we've collaborated for about 10 years now. And at the University of Maryland, we have this system, the black box. Inside this black box is pretty much everything you saw here. I'm exaggerating only slightly. It's all in there. It's about a cubic meter. Um, two things I'll point out. One, it's got a san very fancy Sandia chip that holds, um, we have a template for 32 qubits, but we could probably hold more if we want to. This is room temperature, so we're not going to go much more than 32. But we have 32 laser beams. Our uh, acousto-optic modulator has 32 channels, and we have control of all of those. Um, and also, the CW lasers that do the detection and, and, and readout indeed came from Mark's company, AOSense. Um, and this is all of the CW lasers here, and that represents pretty much half of this entire table, all in a drawer. It's really amazing. <laughs> but when you know, as Jung Sang always says, when you know what you want to build, you can make it really small. And the, the added benefit, when you make it small, it will perform better. So kind of double feedback there. So if this looks like, a, uh, by the way, this project is funded by IARPA. It's a fairly outsized project. And we are afforded to have relations with, with, uh, with strategic uh, corporate partners that provide some of the key um, technologies, including the CW lasers, the acousto-optic modulator from Harris, and that laser I talked about from Coherent. Uh, the 355 laser, and of course, Sandia makes, makes these silicon traps. We integrate it all. Um, we don't make a very fancy software stack. We don't put it on the cloud. That's, that, that's action that should be done at a company. And so, Jung Sang and I founded this company, IonQ, and we're, we have 30 employees now. And 
this, this is a picture of, of, their, of their first prototype system, not really up and running yet, but uh, it looks sort of exploded, but this is the same cube that I showed you, it's opened up, and all this stuff, we haven't, we haven't need to condense it, but it's all electronics and, and CW lasers. Um, so I think with that, I had a few other slides I wanted to say. Um, one, that's, one that's a little cute is from my um, colleague Bill Phillips. And stepping back, this has a couple of meanings for me. He, he's fond of saying that a quantum computer is more different than a classical computer than that classical computer is from an abacus. And his, his, his meaning here is that the classical computer and the abacus are both Turing machines in the abstract. You can model them as moving classical information around even though they look quite different. But these are quite different beasts. This is not a Turing machine. It works with quantum superpositions and entanglements. It's totally different. And I think um, it's important to keep that in mind theoretically, but also experimentally. There's no reason a quantum computer is going to look anything like this. Why should it? It's so radically different. So even though, uh, well, to this, this friendly crowd, atomic physics is not weird. It's um, atomic physics systems are, have not yet found their way into uh, into the behemoth corporate uh, uh, structure in quantum computing, I'm including Microsoft, Intel, IBM, and Google. They're going to they're going to uh, try their hand at superconducting circuits because you can print them on a chip and design control systems. But my bold prediction is that they're going to be, um, if they're in the field at all, they're going to be uh, investing in atomic physics in the in the soon future. Okay. In the last slide, I stole from the latest issue of MIT Tech Review. Um, it's about blockchain, actually, but I, I, I took that off. Um, to me, quantum computing is maybe captured here. I think there's a lot of hope, but you know, some of the hype, a lot of it is, a lot of it is uh, kind of ridiculous, but there is something there. And I think uh, as an experimentalist, I'm comfortable to say that we need to build it to find out where that something is. So with that, uh, I'll conclude with a picture of my group. and. Uh, 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 always interested in good people who want to move to the, uh, the to to Washington, even in this day and age. So please let me know if that's you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Chris, for a great talk. Um, I'm sure Chris would be happy to answer questions. Yes, uh, I had a question about uh, relating to the scaling. More, more of a general question about quantum computing. Uh, so I, I was interested in the plot you showed very early about the, uh, the readout where you use the decoherence to, uh, to eliminate all but just a few or, or one uh, possible output state. Uh, so, so I was wondering about the, uh, how the entropy behaves in the system. Oh, yeah, good question. I almost commented on it. Um, I, I was curious because it, in, in the initial state, it seems like there's a lot of Yeah. Is there any sort of uh, dynamic uh, difficulty inherent in that that would make it hard to scale to okay. a larger system? So, so this is um, yeah, this is not really accurate because it looks like we're not conserving entropy. I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah. This is not decoherence. This is all coherent and unitary. And the way you the way you preserve the unitarity, and I didn't show it, is you have to have some workspace. And so, um, uh, with with all these qubits, I think you need at least two n. Uh, you, you need another n qubits that keeps track of the input state. That's basically what you do. So you take that input state, you make it twice, and one of them goes this way and the other one uh, well, keeps that, its information. My question is different from that. So, the, uh, so I know it's a, the whole thing is a unitary process uh, that you're applying to a pure state. So it's actually the, the entropy of the whole system is, is zero. But mm -hmm. uh, if I was more curious about the, the entanglement entropy of uh, of subcomponents of the system. Yeah. So if you, if you measure that, does that actually decrease over time? Or are you reducing oh, it should. If there's entanglement, it will, yes. The, yeah. the, 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 if you take a subsystem in a quantum, this is a definition of quantum mechanics. If you take a subsystem, the entropy is bigger than the entire system. Right. So yeah, I mean, if you have entanglement, that will come for the ride. It's almost a definition of entanglement. Yeah, so, the, so I was wondering if, if to get this, uh, this output state, uh, you actually have to Oh, I think I see what you're saying. Um, that's probably true, and I don't. I, I'm 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 a little bit on thin ice there, but indeed, the the simplicity of this output means that somehow that entropy went elsewhere in different entanglements. 
And that's, that's why you need these. All right, that's a good line of question here. That's why you need to have that workspace. Okay. Yeah, so, well, so if you scale it to a very large system, uh, is, I was wondering if that can make it difficult. Is it like trying to uncrack an egg at some point? Uh, oh, I think I see what you're getting to. Um, I guess the answer is yes, it's, it is difficult. It's almost like an analog computer that as you grow, you have this exponential uh, uh, cost to pay and stability. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't talk about at all, except for five seconds, is the idea of error correction. And it's more redundancy, not just 2N, but you might need, you might need 100N. And if you can redundantly encode things, you can pump out uh, that noise uh, from the instability. It's called quantum error correction, and it, and it proceeds exactly like classical error correction. Remember the old parity check in memory. You, you, you waste a little bit of space to store redundant information, but it can check and, in fact, even correct for errors that occur. That's a fascinating subject in its own right, and I didn't talk about it at all, sorry. But indeed, um, to do that, you need millions of qubits to begin with, so we're not even close to doing that. So up until we get to tens, thousands, or up to millions of qubits, we're not going to be doing error correction for useful computation. So we need to do our job right. And if it's 10,000 gates, that's only four nines. In atomic clocks, four nines is easy. <laughs> All right, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm being very optimistic here, but I, I don't worry about four nines. I worry about six or seven nines, I guess, in the fidelity of all our operations here. But I don't know where that end point is, I guess, and that's sort of what I meant. We need to build it, and maybe 10,000 is not enough for something interesting. Maybe 1,000 is enough, so we'll just have to see. Thanks. Well, um, we can borrow ideas from classical computing. There are universal families of gates. If you can apply a NAND gate on any pair of classical bits, you can do absolutely everything. In fact, that is the native, the native gate in CMOS, the NAND gate. So it turns out in quantum computing, there are also families of gates. One of them are the rotation gates and the CNOT gate. If you can apply the CNOT between any pair and the rotation of arbitrary angle of any single uh, qubit, then, then that's universal. You can, yeah, you can so reduce any circuit to that. Yeah, it's like when you crack the uh, IMPAC, you use the IC gate. Yeah. How do you crack the CNOT? Gate? Oh, sorry, I don't have, I, I don't have that slide. But um, the, the XX gate, um, if we surround it by five rotations on the two qubits, uh, why would it be five? I, maybe it, I, it's just. It's just four, I think, yeah. So we have two rails, two qubits, and there's an XX gate in the middle, and we put two rotations on the input and two on the output. And we can tune those angles, um, and we get a CNOT gate. Um, the, the XX gate is as expressive as the CNOT gate. So it's, that, like I said, it's of similar power. It is part of a universal family. And that's where the art of compiling comes in. Um, and there's no, it 